Friday soon though, believe it or not. Not soon enough, huh? No. We'll say why. I'm around. <laughs> I've been seeing a lot of Friday this weekend. You get a new computer tank? No. Oh, okay. I thought you were saying you got your new computer Friday. Oh, no. I think there's going to be a lot of students asking for a new laptop for Christmas. No. I'm going to recommend it. My mom and dad told me I'd get one when I I'm going to recommend it. I don't think they're broken. I just think they're not dated. I had a lot of students that were like, the lockdown browser isn't working with my laptop. My laptop is slow. Or like the battery lasts for like 15 minutes. So... They only last for so long. I wear them out very quickly. <laughs> I mean, one year, maybe a year and a half. I bought a laptop three years ago. Shot. I just, I can crash anything. <laughs> Bicycles, cars, tractors, computers. Put enough weight on it, it'll crash. It will. I'm talking about like my workload. I'm not even working hard, you know what I'm saying? Like I don't need to do a whole lot. I'm trying to make some presentations. <laughs> All I'm trying to do is run PowerPoint, maybe a little bit of Excel, and they're like, Whoa. All right, y'all ready to go ahead and get started? I appreciate y'all showing up on a Monday. It's real rainy. It's like sleeping in weather, not coming to school at all. Um, speaking of rain and water, uh, we're going to hopefully finish this up today, talking about water stress. Um, I think we left off here with evaporation, um, and the difference between those two being what? What is the difference between evaporation and transpiration? Try again. It's okay. Evaporation happens from. So lakes and rivers and streams and creeks and stuff. And what about transpiration? Okay, so we have so we have evaporation that happens from a water body, one way to remember it, and then transpiration actually happens through a membrane or a pore of some sort. Um, and it's, I just happen to use us as an example. But plants also have pores, right? They have the stomata, and that's where the water transpires out of. And so we have evapotranspiration, the combination of both. So, uh, and how we measure that? We measure that as potential evapotranspiration. So those are three, three different things we're talking about. Evaporation is from a water body or from the soil. There's water in the soil that can evaporate just naturally um, and then we have plants that are also using that and so those two combined together kind of uh, make that process happen faster and so we have potential evapotranspiration um, and that the, those densely vegetated areas transpire about 65 percent compared to an open pan have any of y'all done any type of outdoor 
weather research with open pans, evapotranspiration pans? No? Okay, we'll look at it in just a moment. Um, but it's about 65% of that. And so if we have plants that are on our property or on our land, uh, we can expect that evapotranspiration to decrease a little bit because the plants are still holding on to some of that water. Um, some of the things that are going to affect that are climate. Arizona, harsh climate, hot, no humidity, no uh, the moisture potential in the atmosphere way greater than negative 100 bars. So any type of water that does fall, it evaporates right back up into the atmosphere. Um, relative humidity or cloud cover or wind speed. Uh, if any of you are going into research, these are going to be factors that are going to influence how your plants respond. Some of the characteristics of the plant. So that's why you take plant science and maybe you take a couple of plant classes with Dr. Earhart and change your major. Uh, you can come over to agronomy. Um, so rooting depth or some of that leaf morphology uh, we have in, I'm going to use Arizona just because it's a, it's a stark contrast from what we have here. Like they don't have leaves on cacti. <laughs> There's no leaves on the cactus. Um, but they have a different uh, structure. It's a very waxy plant. So it holds that moisture in because it can't lose it to the atmosphere because that moisture potential is so much greater on the outside than it is on the inside. So it must protect as much water as it can. And then finally, the crop type. So we're going to have different evapotranspiration in the summertime because the temperature is hot. And when it's hot, we sweat and the plants are going to sweat. That's how they cool themselves. That's how we cool ourselves. Um, however, in the wintertime, evapotranspiration is not going to be as great because it's cold and there's more uh, moisture in the atmosphere, so it doesn't go anywhere. It stays in the soil or in the plant. So we don't have to take that into consideration. We typically don't have to irrigate winter crops. Also think about this, when does it rain a lot? summer how about the spring spring and winter so during those times that temperature is changing the weather patterns are changing and we don't have the evaporation because there's plenty of water so this is just a look at a class a evaporation pan uh, this might be something you would see in a more uh, scientific or a more uh, in-depth intense area and what they're just trying to like we kind of have one of these out where i live when i cross over the median uh, onto 111 there's like a weather station right there that says do not disturb this is tennessee department of transportation's weather monitor um, there are several different components to this uh, primarily that we have something along the data so that we don't have to come back out but this pan um, if we know the area and the depth I know you don't want to do math today, so we're not going to. But if you know the area, <laughs> my man Henry's like, thank you, you love my calculator. Um, so if we know the area and the depth, we can calculate a volume. And once we know the area and the depth, we can calculate the loss or the change in depth from day to day. And we can measure how much water was actually lost to which one, and evaporation or transpiration out of the pan. Evaporation, correct. So evaporation out of a water body. So it's not necessarily that it's a lake or a creek, it's a water body. We also have some plants nearby that we can measure that as well. And that's how people will measure that evapotranspiration. Um, again, I asked previously if anyone was uh, in forestry or going, is anyone going into watershed management of any kind? This is what they do. They, they measure the inputs and outputs of water. So we have these things about water use efficiency, uh, transpiration ratios, because people like to make something very simple into a science, and plant water use is going to be a big thing in the future because we're not gonna have as much water. The temperature's about to rise and when the temperature rises, we get more evapotranspiration. So we need to know what the water, uh, the, the water use efficiency is of our plants. 
So we can apply just the right amount of water, not overwatering, applying just the right amount of water so that we're saving our natural resources. Mm -hmm. Some of the things that are going to influence that water use efficiency I mentioned about waxy leaves they'll also reflect some of that solar radiation our temperature our relative humidity wind how much water we actually have is being supplied there what's up Hayden you're shaking your head you get a haircut yeah what's up what's that what's that? I hate that there's another the word and see I get mine cut real close so whenever I get it shaved, like I got this tan and then this white part from, from where my hair was. I mentioned about absorbing that solar radiation. And so we have this leaf area index, which is the leaf area per unit of land area. And so We might have a, a plant with a large leaf, like maybe let's say cotton, and then we have a plant with a thin leaf, let's say corn, and a cotton leaf would have more leaf area index than a corn plant. So the leaf architecture is going to influence how much sunlight makes it to the surface. And so if we can block the sunlight from the surface, we can keep the water in the soil, and the plant therefore has a better chance of taking that up. Some climatic conditions, we're also going to have plant cover uh, in relation to soil surface, which is what I just explained, and that's going to influence our plant water use efficiency. And then also length of season and the growing, um, the length and season and the growth period. So like knowing these things about your plant, how you can keep your soil covered longer is going to minimize water loss to the atmosphere. So having some sort of cover crop or mulch over your system is going to help make, keep that water in the soil. Our whole goal is to maximize soil storage for our plants. So anything we can do to minimize evapotranspiration or transpiration, um, we'll be doing good. There wasn't a whole lot to write down in this chapter. Um, cover crops are going to be something that we are going to try to use more and more in the future. Uh, they serve several benefits. If you go to some cover crop field day, they will have slides and slides and slides of all the positive things that can happen from cover crops. But for the purposes of uh, this class and soils, we're just mainly focused on trying to increase water filtration or some soil storage because if we have cover crops on the field, remember we talked about the fate of water and intersection being one of those. So if we have cover crops on the field, the rain will hit that cover crop and we have some stem flow or maybe some canopy drip or through fall. And I know we're thinking about a cover crop as being like clover of some sort or some legume that's about maybe this tall off the ground but it still changes the impact of that rain, raindrop. And when that happens, it disperses and then it makes it into the soil rather than running off. It just slows that water down. We have percolation. I remember talking about infiltration being the movement into the soil. So into the soil in this top top couple of inch region and then percolation is actually movement through the soil. We can have percolation loss or leaching, kind of similar thing where we have more water entering the soil than the soil can hold. It has to go somewhere. Um, as, that, as we have that percolation loss, some of those nutrients or chemicals that are in the soil that are water soluble like nitrate, 
will actually be dissolved in that water as it moves to the ground table. As, I mean, as it moves to the water table into our groundwater supply. So we want to make sure that we're applying enough nutrients for the plant and enough water, but we really can't control the rain, can we? So kind of knowing what your percolation rate is, your KSAT, um, will help you minimize some of that nitrate movement into the water. If I'm not mistaken, you were working on nitrogen and moving into the water and like, that was my thing from from my masters is trying to minimize that. going to be on the test Wednesday. That's what I meant. That's what I knew that I wanted to mention. Um, I'm going to send out a, a email about who wants to take the test on Wednesday. Okay, I'll try to do that as soon as I leave class. Um, you don't have to, uh, but I'd at least like to know who is. That way I know how many people can be when and where. Um, so going back to our, our soil layers, like each one of these layers plays a significant role in filtering our water. And we can use soil to clean our water. My PhD was on using plants to clean the water where we had kind of a wetland environment and the plants were doing their process in that wetland. We had a simulated wetland. Um, but we can use the soil as well. So they have like subsurface flow where they allow that water to come up through the soil and the properties of soil will take out some of those contaminants. As our water moves through each of these layers, it becomes more pure and pure so that when it gets to our aquifers, we have clean water. So we have the organic layer, which is gonna have a large water holding capacity because there's a lot of organic matter. Uh, surface, our B horizon, C, and then finally the bedrock. And again, we're gonna have some, the, the majority of our percolation losses are gonna happen in winter and early spring because that's when we have the most rainfall. And since I've moved up to Tennessee where we have snow, uh, not something I'm used to in Mississippi, um, that snow is going to impact that as well. So now we have anti-seed moisture content on top of all of the rain that's coming because April showers bring May flowers and we're losing the nutrients that we just applied to make our crops grow. And primarily in this region, it's hay. So when the snow melts, and we finally go to put our fertilizer on there, we get a whole bunch of rain and our fertilizer is washed out of the system. We have nitrogen that's in our system now. We have phosphorus that's in our system. We have all these nutrients that we just spent a lot of money on <clears throat> washed away. There are certain places in our soils uh, where water can be kind of perched. This is a perched water table where we have water that moved into the infiltrated and then percolated to this perched water table. It might have came out the side of a mountain or a um, hill or slope as a spring. Uh, but all this aquifer and the water table will fluctuate seasonally because our rainfall fluctuates seasonally. I didn't have a lot. It was just kind of to show you that there are places in the soil and how the water is held in there. And we had this capillary fringe that we, some water will move up into our soil profile through capillary action. That water table is going to move in response to uh, percolation and then also how much water is being added into that system. Nothing right down here either. 
Uh, we need to worry about minerals um, from weathering of the rocks. Uh, so those, those rocks will continue to break down and um, dissolve and send some nutrients into that water. Um, some of our organic compounds, obviously our fertilizers and our pesticides, water movement and percolation losses through the soil will eventually contaminate our groundwaters. If we didn't have soil that could hold on to those compounds, our water supply would be contaminated. And then more a look at how water is moved from factories and we end up having this contamination from a factory that might be miles away from a stream. Um, and there are people out there at the Environmental Protection Agency who monitor things like that. From an agricultural standpoint, our biggest problem is eutrophication, nitrogen and phosphorus. Those are the two big ones that are going to uh, give agriculture a bad rap. So when you're managing your lands, understanding how much fertilizer you're putting out, when you're putting it out, um, does it match the plant needs? What is your environment? What is your climate like? Uh, we have 4R nutrient stewardship putting out the right source at the right rate, right time and right place. We can have contamination of our drinking water um, and then also some human pathogens and pesticides and other wastes. And we have the Gulf of Mexico and the hypoxia zone. But these hypoxia zones can also happen in our lakes and our ponds that we tend to frequently know. On the other hand, we need to make sure that the water is moving away from our crops because we need that system to continuously flow. We need that movement to complete the hydrologic cycle. So uh, if we cannot drain that soil, uh, then we could have some, some plant problems. So we we'll use things like a surface drainage ditch. Some of us can do landforming, um, I know Hayden Farms out in the Delta, or you're from West Tennessee, right? So we, there's no, there's no elevation there, is there? I got some elevation. Most of it's flat though, right? So what they'll do is they'll come out with a, with a um, grading system with it's got GPS guidance on it, it raises and lowers, and it will slope that land one, maybe 2% so that that water actually does drain. In the Midwest, like um, where our more sandy soils are, we can have drain tiles that will take that water and move it very quickly out of that system. Uh, this is also something you would see like in a golf green or on some sort of sports field. It's built on sand. And once that water moves to the drain tile, we can send it out of the, out of the system in a, in a point source kind of way. And so something that we have, and I'll bring this up later when we talk about nitrogen, uh, but in the Midwest having these nitrate problems, what they do is they have this drainage tile that sends it out to a creek or whatnot. And when I was a master's student working on nitrogen, um, I was taking a soil and water class and the professor told me that I needed to do um, uh, this project on presentation on bioreactors. And I'm thinking it's gonna be micro, dirty jobs. It's gonna be like some super high, with everyone's gonna have on their hazmat suit or whatever. And it turns out all it really was was a ditch with some wood chips in it. I know, right? I was like, really, it's just that simple? And so that drainage water that had the nitrates in it, they let it sit in that ditch with the wood chips and they completed the nitrogen cycle so that it went from nitrate through denitrification back to into gas and was released back into the atmosphere. And I was like, you gotta be kidding me, it's just pine bark? So there are other ways that we can go about decontaminating or cleaning our water supplies other than sending them through um, waste facilities. It's gonna be up to us in order to figure out how to do that on our fields. Uh, mold drainage um, is the final one and I'm not really sure. I haven't really seen too many of these other than the land forming, uh, the, the, the ditches and the drain tiles. Okay.
Here's that extensive, um, precise, precision, land grading material. Um, machines, you might have seen them if you go out that Main Street going out towards All Good. They're building an apartment complex or maybe it's a food line or something. They're, they're building something out there. Uh, but these machines were moving around that property, uh, making sure that everything was sloped the correct way and it was land for. Open ditch. Uh, this might be something similar to uh, kind of the same principle as a football field or a soccer field. Those fields are not flat. They have, they're not, are they? They have a very slight crown on them. And so it's just enough that it'll move that water off naturally on its own. Flat, not so good. We need to have some sort of elevation or some slope that is going to move that water. A look at some subsurface drainage tiles and how those work. They're just moving water at a quicker pace and trying to get that um, out of the system and into one of those uh, bioreactors. And then mold drainage, they're just pulling this little bullet through the soil and creating kind of an underground pipe. But there's a problem with this. Is that pipe going to stay open? What happens if you get a clog right here? <laughs> you're, you're right back to the same problem that you had. So, um, not all of these are great. But what is important is making sure that if you go to build a house somewhere, uh, none of y'all are going to be soil scientists, but these are the types of things that they study. They study percolation tests and uh, how well um, water is going to move through soils, what type of CEC they are. Um, are they going to be able to retain some of those nutrients and some of the waste products that are in our byproduct? Um, are they going to be able to take out the uh, polyphenols and the decomposed toilet paper and all of those things? Like how do those go in? How do those get flushed out of the system when we have microbes that are breaking that down? Uh, just a different look at some of the septic tanks. Ooh, I didn't, do I have it in here? Nope. Um, I once had a picture, you could see where the septic tank had failed. You could see the septic lines on the ground uh, that had failed and the water was now no longer moving through the soil profile. So like those things are going to influence some of that. Like you might run into this if you build, a, if, if you want to build not on city water. You'll go, oh, that's what Nationals was talking about in the soils. So you'll have to get a perk test. They'll look at the aeration, microbial activity, some of the reactivity so that it can hold those positive, those cations and those anions, uh, and they'll charge you a lot of money for that. There's good money in that, um, being a soil scientist. We'll use this for our irrigation, uh, primarily our food production. And so we use 16% you know, of the land that we actually use for agriculture, we're actually putting water on and applying for irrigation. This is something y'all are going to run into in the future. Do y'all remember the, in the very beginning of class, I showed you that biodome that y'all, it's possible that y'all might end up operating one day. If you have a dome over your cropland, how are you going to, how are you going to capture all that water? Where are you going to get the water from? What's the system going to look like inside the biodome if we change the way that the hydrologic cycle operates? Like it, it's going to be a lot different when you put a dome over it. So like these are some things that you will encounter. We are running out of water and we can't get it back. It's in the atmosphere as water vapor, not in our fields, not in our tables as water. So. Y'all remember this and you go, oh, I remember Nasher's talking about this and we need to do this instead of that. Maybe we need to increase some drainage and save this from soil and water conservation. And we have green roofs and we have rain barrels and we have 
rain gardens. How are we supposed to capture this? We need to be able to retain our water so that we can survive. And these are practices that you're gonna to have to tell your producers. Hey, you don't have enough to feed your animals. Maybe you might wanna think about doing rain barrels or some rain collection, some capturing mechanism of some sort. I guess in agriculture, we probably, I mean, in um, agronomy, we use this a lot because we are trying to maximize our output and minimize our input. You don't need to apply irrigation the day before it rains. And we don't always know when it's gonna rain, so maybe we need to apply just a little bit of water to get us through into the next rain. Um, understanding what our efficiency is, that if I apply 100 gallons and only 50 of those gallons actually get used, all right, I'm doing pretty good. But if I apply 100 and only 10 of those gallons I can account for, that's not a good system. Um, just to look at some of the ways that we actually apply water. Um, and we got some really cool things coming out with water uh, with precision agriculture and variable rate irrigation craziest thing we just keep on making it just more technologically advanced we fly a drone over a field it captures what the soil moisture content is it monitors the plants and then we have an irrigation we have a center pivot and each nozzle drops exactly the right amount of water at exactly the right area um, in 2014 we went to one of those conferences where they were doing that and you can see all the little groups put it in here you can see all the little grids as that center pivot moves around it knows to put more water out here less water out there more water up here in the red and less water in the middle um, because we're trying to maximize and optimize our water use efficiency we don't need to just be applying furrow irrigation just because we have water just because we can water rights are going to become a big thing anybody interested in uh, some sort of ag policy and if you can be a water lawyer you got your ticket punched because who owns the water who's going to fight for that whose water is who, I mean who owns the Ogallala aquifer the people well they should be able to use the water but they're using the water inefficiently and now the rest of the people who don't use the water won't have any so those are going to be some things that we will be facing here in the near future so we'll be using different types of irrigation we have drip irrigation subsurface irrigation uh, micro irrigation and just we're trying to get more efficient with our production practices and that's kind of what my uh, that's what agronomy is we're trying to get efficient with our production practices and not that in a pasture situation you're going to be applying irrigation uh, but to understand that at some point in time there's not going to be any water for those pastures how are we going to go about helping our producers make enough food so they can feed our animals or grow their crops that's where that stuff's going to apply um, and then i put in some information about uh, some of the different um, irrigation efficiencies probably not You'll probably use this. Maybe uh, Hayden will use it. Um, but if you're not into some horticulture or you're going to the vet school, I don't know. Um, but just having some information about how our water use efficiency is and what, how we can improve that um, is going to be beneficial in the future. That's all I got on water. Does anybody have any questions or comments or thought processes on that? It's lunchtime. All right. Y'all have a good day.